June for your mighty accompaniment and it's lovely to have our beloved brother on the guitar. It, it really helps the meeting, doesn't it? And indeed, we've been hearing tonight about the Spirit of God and uh, I can assure you we are very much aware of the Spirit of God in this meeting this evening. As a matter of fact, uh, I had to rush at the last minute because you keep on changing the times over here in <laughs> Scotland. We don't do that in Northern Ireland. It's 8 o'clock every night except Sunday and that's 7. And that's the way it sits. But over here, it's sort of one time one night and another time another night. And I forgot to ask John and Sadie, what time am I supposed to be finished at? And uh, so I had to rush at the last minute there and find out you're here at 11. <laughs> it's lovely to see you this evening and we thank you very much indeed for coming. We know that there are some who have had to come quite a distance to be here, but we just are so happy to be with you. Now I want to, uh, let me explain this, other preachers don't do this, but I, I like to be simple. I like to be very simple because I am a simple person and uh, I remember that whenever I didn't know the Lord, uh, I appreciated someone else explaining the thing simply to me. And this isn't a lecture. I want you to realize, dear unsaved one, you're not in for a lecture tonight. That's not why we have come here. You see, sometimes people don't realize where we're coming from. If you went to an old spiritist meeting, you would expect to meet with the devil, wouldn't you? And you would go home and I'm telling you, you would feel that there was eyes on you all night, and there probably are. We're in the presence of God just now. This is a spiritual meeting, not a spiritualist meeting, but a spiritual meeting. It's not a social gathering. It's not a political gathering. We're gathered here in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and unto him and him alone. And he has promised, and we know that the Son of God cannot lie. He could never have been our Savior if he told one lie. He would have been a liar. And if he was a liar, he's a sinner. And if he's a sinner, then he would go to hell himself. He couldn't be our savior. I want you to understand the foundation upon which we're standing tonight. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in flesh. That's who he is. That's what the word of God says. Now we know that he's the son of God, but the father is God, the son and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the triune God. And our Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in flesh. Although he was a perfect human, he has a dual nature. Now, I want to say this to you, that I come over here from Northern Ireland having thrashed out uh, what I believed was the direction that we had to go in these meetings because you don't want to be coming over at the last minute and uh, then starting to wonder, what am I going to preach tonight? So you spend a time before God, and you seek his face, and, and he brings you to a sort of a conclusion. Why would you do that, do you ask? Because only God knows who's going to be here tonight. I probably don't even know you or anything about you. But God knows all about you. And God has had his eye on you from before you were born. And God has made sure you've come here this evening. So I have got to be careful to get into the presence of God and make sure that the direction that I thought I was going tonight is the right one. So we a busy morning this morning. We spoke at the breaking of bread and then afterwards we ministered to the saints. So then we went home for a bite of dinner and I got up the stairs and into the word of God and I'm seeking God's word. And suddenly it's like spilled water just and I know that feeling I've had it too often I remember once that happened to me and I was in an awful state and I says Lord you know it takes me a couple of days to know your mind to get the word of God for a meeting I have only three hours to go and you're showing me here this is not the message it's impossible for that to happen because what would I do I can't get another message now and the Lord gave me it like that told me about Moses burying the body of the Egyptian that he killed and how that those sons blow away and sin has a habit of becoming <coughs> uncovered. Be sure, your sin will hunt you. It will hunt you down. It will track you like a wild animal. We think it's water under the bridge. No. 
Be sure. There's not much you can be sure of these days, but be sure the Word of God says your sin will find you out. And so I preached that night, and a young man who had been involved in a murder went and gave himself up. He was only out for the weekend on remand. They had already gone five years. Now he was going back to do another nine. You see, that's how serious this is, friend. Why have I told you all that? Because this afternoon the Lord just showed me, you've got the wrong message. You've got the wrong message. And I said, Lord, please don't do this. I've learned to know the feeling. And I knew it was gone. So he has completely changed the message for the meeting tonight. Now why did I tell you all that? Because I want you to understand how seriously we take this. I want you to understand that if I had been only coming with a lecture, I could have given you something from the top of my head. <coughs> After all, I've been preaching for about 35 years. I'm sure there's something in there somewhere. But no. You are in the presence of the one who promised where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. There's a time when I wouldn't have believed that. But I'm more sure now that he's here than I am that you're here. And I can see you. I've lived with him. I've worshipped him. He's looked after me. 40 years. And I love him with all my heart. It's hard for a man to talk like that about another man, but this is the God man we're talking about. The God man. Now, okay, I hope you've sort of seen where I'm coming from. I thought that was important. Um, I'm assuming something here this evening. I'm assuming that you came here tonight fundamentally because you want to know in your heart how you can get right with God because you know somehow or other that there's something wrong with your relationship with God you know somehow or other that things are not what they should be you know somehow or other that you can't boast yourself even of tomorrow even if you're young the youngest person in this meeting could be the first one into the coffin I've had the sad occasion of uh, officiating at many funerals, some of, of children that never were even born and died in the womb. Some were three months old. And friend, all sorts of ages. It's a heartbreaking thing. But I can tell you, you've only to visit a graveyard and read the gravestones and you'll find out it's not just the old people die. So many young people are even taking their own lives in these days. Why would they do that? Why is it we haven't got the message over to them that they can get a brand new life now that they've never had before? That they can get rid of that old one without hanging themselves and they can live for eternity? We haven't got the message over, brethren. But I'm wanting to quote to you, first of all, before we read together in another passage of Scripture, Something that I'm convinced God is saying to this meeting. And we welcome you at home there. It's lovely to see you all sitting. Well, you can get a cup of tea. We're in here for an hour anyway, and we can't do that. But welcome, and we want you to listen as God speaks to you as well. God says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, at the beginning of the verse. Now, God said this. As a matter of fact, it says, the Lord said. My spirit shall not always strive with man. Now, I didn't say that. God says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. So many people take it for granted. Well, I'm 70, I'm 80, I'm 85, now I've been here. For 365 days every year. And this year's going to be no different. It's all over. It's all over. My spirit shall not always strive with man. Now I want you to come with me to 
John's Gospel, chapter 3, please. Familiar scriptures, but don't take them for granted. I'm convinced God has put this on my heart for this meeting this evening. And it's John's Gospel, chapter 3, please. John, chapter 3. I think what we'll do is we'll read the first 16 verses together and then I'll be able to refer to them without keeping turning to them individually as I comment. So it's John chapter 3 and verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, or truly, truly, with all the conviction of my heart and with all the earnestness that I possess, I assure you, that's what that means. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Did you think you were on your way to heaven? You never murdered anybody, she you didn't. You never committed adultery. You've never stolen anything. You're a good person. Clean living. Go to church, chapel, your mosque, the temple, wherever. Friend, except a man be born again, <coughs> Jesus said, come and see the kingdom of God. Never mind after it. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whether it goeth. You don't know where it came from or where it went. So is every one that is born in the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? <coughs> Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you, earthly things. <clears throat> Born again is an earthly thing, sir. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we pray earnestly that God will bless the reading of his own infallible word to all our hearts for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brilliant to be with you tonight. I hope you're comfortable. And uh, I hope you're uh, warm enough, happy, because we want you to enjoy the meeting. We don't want you to endure it. And it's great to see you. It really is. We have read the Holy Scriptures here concerning this religious man, Nicodemus, and he was a religious man. And he's coming to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and he's coming by night. He's on the night shift. 
I want to underline two great truths that are very, very important and very relevant to this gathering just now. You see, dear unsaved soul in the meeting, you need to know that the Holy Spirit himself has already been at work in your life long before you came near this place tonight. He's been working away in the background. He's been preparing you to come to the Saviour. You say, I didn't know anything about that. No, I know, neither did I. And you'll hear tomorrow night if the Lord tarries and we're spared and you come along. The amazing way that God brought me, I didn't even understand that it was happening until after I came to the Saviour. Two very great truths I want you to see here. The Holy Spirit of God is engaged and is operating in this man Nicodemus's circumstances as he comes to the Saviour. The Holy Spirit of God is at work here. Almighty God himself says in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 16, And I will lead the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. You see, that simply means that as we who are now saved, we redeemed believers, as we look back to the time in our experience when the Holy Spirit of God began to take a dealing with us in our sinful lives and to actively work in our lives to bring us to the Savior. It definitely didn't seem to us like that was what was happening. Far from it. Everything seemed to be the opposite. Everything seemed to go haywire. I often think of the blind man. You remember in John chapter 9 we're told about the blind man. Imagine you're a blind man for a moment. The Lord comes over and the disciples are talking about him and he can hear them, you see, but he can't see them. And they're saying, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born by? A whole conversation is going on. And the Lord just spits on the ground and he makes clay of the spittle and he starts to put it on this fellow's eyes. Are you going to tell me he didn't push his arms away and say, what are you doing? Go and leave me alone. Man, when God starts to work on your life, it's not all a bed of roses. Sometimes you kick against it. You say, I don't want this. What's going on here? Is there a curse on me or something? That's what I used to think. And yes, there was. The curse of the broken law of God. But praise God, on that cross, he became a curse for us to set us free from the curse for all eternity. Yes, with the benefit of hindsight, we realize now that it was the Lord. But it, it, we... We read in, I, in Isaiah, wasn't it? It was Isaiah. And I will bring the blind by a way that they know not. And when they get to the cross and they get saved and they look back and they say, I never would have thought going all that way would have got me here where I wanted to be in the first place. That's exactly what it means. So I want you to see that the Holy Spirit is at work in this man's life. The other thing, the second thing is that the truth is also foundational to his conversion as our wonderful Savior and Lord Jesus Christ gives him this mighty revelation. Where would we be if you tore John chapter 3 out of your Bible? If we never had had it? We'd have been down, the whole lot of us. Friend, listen. He gives him a mighty revelation of truth about the new birth. And both these things were foundational to him coming and getting seen because he did get seen. Yes, he come right out for God. Not that night, but he did eventually. Now what I'm trying to say to you is this, that God is a spirit. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ, you see, I was going to be thinking about a whole other thing altogether and I couldn't understand why the Lord had led me that way, but I sort of know now because there's a combination in some senses going on here. And the woman at the well was just a wee woman who had had five husbands. How's it dear? Five husbands? <laughs> oh, look at the women folk like that. <laughs> Where would you start? Five husbands. And the man that you now have isn't your husband. She was just shacked up with him. The Lord knew all about her. And you know what he said to that wee lowly woman? It's wonderful the way when the Lord's given mighty revelations of truth. He gives them to the most insignificant of people, like me, like you. 
He says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's something that we believers must never forget. Our God is a spirit. He's a spirit. They that worship him, that's us, must worship him in spirit and in truth. And our lives are not controlled, you know, by chance or by fate or by slop hazard and personal forces. There's a divine dimension to our lives. We make sure that even if we're 30 stone, we get the proper vitamins every day. You get on the vitamin top to make sure you're not lacking in anything. Don't we, husband? We go to so much trouble to look after ourselves physically. I'm covering myself <laughs> up here. But listen, man cannot live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you see, there's a spiritual side to you. You were made in God's image. That doesn't mean you look like him. But he made you triune, a triune being. He's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You are body, soul, and spirit. And you look after your body. And what do you do with your poor soul? Well, the devil, he feeds that with a lot of old mad music and a whole lot of other things that we shouldn't be involved in before we can see it. Aye, but listen, your body and soul and spirit, and you need to look after your spiritual being because it will last for all eternity when the body drops off dead. <coughs> your departing out of the body, it will either be heaven or hell. Now what I'm saying here is this, that Almighty God has a definite plan and a purpose and an input into your everyday experience even though you might not realize it. You say, but I'm not saying it. I know. And I'm talking to you. God so loved the world. He didn't just love the Christians. God loves you. He hates our sin. But he loves you, poor sinner, just as much as he loves anybody else. And if you had been the only sinner on the earth, Christ would still have come and went to Calvary to die for you, to give you the opportunity of being saved because God loves you so much. Whether you wanted him or not. You see, there are unseen things above that have a bearing on your life and mine. What's this man talking about? Well, the Word of God says that the things that are seen are temporal. I can see that in but sooner or later it will crumble to dust. The things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You see, it's only through faith in the Word of God that we can see what's going on on the other side of the river called death. And friend, this man Nicodemus didn't just go to Jesus. He didn't say, I think I'll go to Jesus. It doesn't say uh, here, Nicodemus went to Jesus. It doesn't say that. It says Nicodemus came. Nicodemus. This was a preordained divine appointment. Just like you come into this meeting tonight, you say you're mad. I'm telling you, friend, God brought you here. And I wouldn't be surprised if the devil did his best to make sure you didn't get But the Lord got you here anyway. This was a divinely preordained appointment. And Nicodemus, what did he do? He came. He came to Jesus. Although he wouldn't have realized all that at the time. He was being drawn by the Spirit of God. He would know it later on. You see, there's a drawing power tonight from the old blood-soaked rugged cross. Sometimes we believers sing, Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world. That's a wondrous attraction for me. You know, it hasn't an attraction for everybody. There are those that hate the Lord. We were preaching about that last night, weren't we? Not everybody loves the Lord. You know. There's men would crucify you for talking about the Lord. Never mind anything else. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised. He's despised. He's rejected of men. He's a man of sorrow. They hate him. 
I remember a time when I'd lost Peter's name. And I'm ashamed to tell you that. But thank God he's able to clean that mouth out with the precious blood of Christ. And he's able to make it praise him. Yes, the cross hasn't got an attraction for everybody. But you thought the tub, haven't you? You know there's something there. You know the drawn part, don't you? You felt it. Even regardless of how much you tried to wriggle away. Can I say this to you? God's eyes are never off you. You say, well, you're going to stand up there and make wild statements. That's not a wild statement. That's a scriptural statement. Let me quote the scripture for you. In 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. God's eyes are watching every human being in China, Japan, Africa, India, Europe, America, Australia. All at the one time he's watching every single individual. All their life long. Seven days a week. 24 hours a day. And what's he looking for? Someone who will exercise faith in his word and turn to him. When it talks about those whose hearts are perfect towards him, it doesn't mean there's people running around the earth sinlessly perfect. It means there are those who are seeking him. There are those who have an exercise of faith before him. Yes, God's eyes have never been off you. Now let me take you a step further. He knows everyone. Every human being's immediate circumstances. He knows their circumstances. He not only knows every one of them, he sees them all at the one time. He knows their immediate, he even knows the thoughts that come into your head. Isn't that amazing? You see, God is all powerful, all knowing. He's omniscient, He's omnipotent. There's a lot of big. I keep out of the big words and try and keep the things simple. You say, George, you're only after saying that God knows every thought that comes into my head. That's right. Why did I say that? I said that because he said that. Listen to Ezekiel 11 and 5. The Spirit of God said this. I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Now, am I right or am I right? If I say what God says, I'm bound to be right. He says, I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. <clears throat> every one of them. So here's God's eyes never off you. Here's God knowing all your circumstances. Here's God knowing every thought that comes into your mind, every one of them. And he knows whether you want to come to the Savior or whether you don't. He says in 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9, For the Lord searcheth all the hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he'll be found of you. But if you forsake him, he'll cast you off forever. See, God knows whether you're here seeking him tonight or not. Or whether you just come because it will please someone else. Or maybe you're curious. Or whatever. You see, in the eyes of men, there's no doubt about the fact that Nicodemus is a righteous personality, humanly speaking. People today would call him good living. <coughs> but he's not saved. He's not saved. Is there someone like that here tonight? I'm not preaching to a murderer tonight, perhaps. Maybe I am. But maybe you, listening to me in this meeting, maybe you're not a murderer. Maybe you're not a thief. I don't know. I was a thief. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're a, 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 a clean, living, righteous sort of person. You know, there's a clean side and a, a filthy side to the broad road, but the whole broad road leads to destruction. Many there be that go in there. Huh? And here's this man. He's one of the Pharisees, one of the strictest religious sect of the Jews of that day. And remember that the majority of them had no time for Christ's teaching and preaching. They hated the Son of God, most of them. Listen, let me explain something to you. You see, I'm sort of trying to help you to get a bit of light here. I'm trying to get you to understand certain things. The people that crucified Christ said prayers, worshipped God, 
gave money into their place of worship, went to the meetings. These Pharisees would have put the Christians to shame, seeking to be righteous. But they didn't want God because they thought we are righteous enough ourselves. So it was self-righteousness. It wasn't the righteousness of God, which is by faith. And so these people were lost. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ says, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? He was talking to long robed religionists who thought they were okay. They didn't need hell. They didn't need Calvary. They didn't need the precious blood or anything else. Man, just see it the way God sees it. A lot of people think that the Lord Jesus died for Christians. That he died for good people with Bibles. Christ died for the ungodly. I wouldn't be here. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And unless you see yourself as God sees you, even a clean living person, you're a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's only one way of salvation. What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You see, you need to know and understand, and this is what I'm dealing with here just now, that man concocted religion over there and biblical Christianity over there are two entirely different things. Two entirely different things. These are days of great confusion. When people think it doesn't matter what religion you are, all religions lead to heaven anyway. They don't. Christ says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I remember I was over in Israel and this lovely Jewish couple, they were lovely people, <laughs> sat down beside anybody sitting. I said, no, oh, come on, sit down, you're welcome. We were in a restaurant. <laughs> the man said, uh, are you Jewish? I said, no, no. I said, we're Christians. We're over here on a tour. I, I bring people over and show them the sites, the biblical sites. And he says, oh, that's lovely. He says, you know, it's not only Jews that are going to uh, be all right at the end of the day. Uh, all religions, he says. You know, if the people are good, he was trying to be nice to me. <laughs> Les looked at me to see like this. And, uh, and I said, sir, and she had me a kick under the table. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to go on, even if I got another kick. And I, I said, sir, look, the Lord Jesus Christ says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, that was a lovely person, that man. I'm sure he was disappointed in me, but I had to tell him the truth. Because one day, that poor man may say, as he stands in the dock at the great white throne of judgment, that boy Pete's never even told me. And when I said all religions are going to heaven, he just smiled. <clears throat> oh no, look, we're living in the light of eternity. The Lord said to this man, Nicodemus, accept the man, be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now I want you to see Nicodemus, he's sincere, he's upright, he's honest. He's intellectually brilliant, this man. Historical records say that he was in charge of the waterworks in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the people were baptized, thousands of them, in the middle of the Judean wilderness. You can believe that or believe it not. But this man is no fool. But he's an unregenerate soul. He's on his way to a lost eternity. And the Lord is challenging everything that Nicodemus stood for. The man isn't in the kingdom at all. These fellows have to memorize entire books of the Bible when they're still kids. You don't become a rabbi. Just like that. This man knew the scriptures. Christ says, are you a ruler? Are you a master of Israel? And you don't know these things? And I'm not going to go into the prophecy of Ezekiel in a gospel meeting tonight, but the Lord expected this man to know that God had promised to put a new heart and a new spirit into those that would worship him. Now I want you to listen to this uh, revealing response of Nicodemus. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? 
Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's not being sarcastic, let me assure you. He's coming down to a basic level and he's seeking to understand this. Can a man go into his mother's womb when he's old? And be born again? What are you trying to say to me, Jesus? I can't understand this, sir. His great mind is sent reading. And the Lord answers, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Two different things. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. You must be born again. It's imperative. There's no alternative to being born again. You see, friend, it was a great day when you were born and you kicked up your heels and your mommy and daddy loved you and they were so glad that you had arrived safely. It was a great day. But unless you're born again, really, really, not like as if you're born again, not turning over a new leaf, getting a brand new life you never had before to live with. Hallelujah. That's the message of God. That's what we've got tonight. I tell you, I have something in my heart that Jesus gave to me 40 years ago. And it wasn't like as if it was a real thing. And so have so many here listening tonight. And let me say again, as we come down and try to uh, uh, get to where you are, dear unsaved one. You see, there are many different forms of life in this old world of ours. You know that. And they're just like steps on a staircase. And the, on the first step, we have bacteriological life. You can't see it without a microscope, can you? It's invisible to the naked eye. And if you come up the ladder, come up the staircase a wee bit, you have vegetable life. You see, trees have got a form of life, and so have vegetables. And then we have animal life. If you come up the next step, isn't that right? And they've got life as well. And then ultimately, there's human life. They're all different. No matter whether the Archbishop of Canterbury believes now that Darwin's right or, uh, Darwin's right or not, the Word of God doesn't teach that. We're all different forms of life. And I have to go into that tonight, let me say. But none of these life forms that I've mentioned can live for all eternity in their present state, can they? I mean, if God was to give you eternal life as a human being, a mere human being, where would you be in a million years? Where would you be in a thousand? Dust. Dust. There's none of these forms of life can live for eternity. We watch our loved ones grow old and infirm and then pass away. And what do we do? We take their mortal remains to the graveyard and we bury them out of our sight. Ten out of ten people tired. You know that. It is appointed unto men once to die. There's nobody arguing with that. But after this, the judgment. Now, that which is of the flesh, Christ says, is flesh. You were born a little baby of the flesh. But that which is born of the spirit. You see, Nicodemus you have all your rules and regalia on, Nicodemus. You're a rabbi. You're a master of Israel. You know the scriptures. They're your second nature. But Nicodemus, you never get living for eternity in that stuff. You've got to be born again another step up the stairway of the Spirit of God. And you'll never die. You'll never die. And you see the old body that crumbles to dust? I'll tell you this, Christ has given the believers new bodies. New bodies. No tear duct, because there'll be no tears. There'll be no crying there. There'll be no death. No more death. What a time it's going to be. This is the bit I love. No more sorrow. Man, that covers it all up, doesn't it? No more sorrow. No more sorrow. Heaven's a wonderful place. But I've got to keep on the track. You see, a pig will never become an angel. You would know that, wouldn't you? And that which is born of a flesh, as humans, will never become an eternal living creature unless they're born again. Now I know that in hell they'll ever be dying, there'll never be an end.
to that torment and that death. It's an everlasting death in hell. Death knows nothing about dying in the sense that you and I would think about it. But if we're going to live for all eternity, we have to experience the new birth. It's really a new birth. Born from above. Born of God's spirit, we sometimes say, with life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what astounding is now. And this new birth occurs whenever the Holy Spirit of God takes the precious word of God and makes it living water to thirsty souls and convicts you of your sin and righteousness and judgment and then goes on to draw you to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance to place saving faith in him. Oh, you say then this takes a few months. Listen. 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost got up out of bed. Some of them combed their hair, and some of them didn't bother like you, and uh, <laughs> washed their faces and put on their clothes. They hadn't a clue that that day they were going to be born again. They didn't even know. They said, men and brethren, they said to the apostles, said Peter and all the rest of the men and brethren, what shall we do? And before they went to bed that night, they were seared and baptized under the water. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let me say this to you. It's not a long drawn out thing. You're here and if you realize tonight that you are a sinner. Then friends, you can't be saved. If you think you're not. If you think you're okay the way you are. Then there's nothing even the Lord Jesus Christ can do for you. Christ. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Nicodemus answered and said, How can these things be? You know what this man said? This man knew all about the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the blood being shed for sins. He knew all about the temple. He knew all about the burnt offering and, and all the offerings that were daily offered. And friend, this man knows that without the shedding of blood, there can't be remission for sins. And so he's, he knows all this. He, he, he's, a, he's an expert on it. And he said, how can this be? How can it be? The Lord starts by saying this. If I have told you, you don't believe me. How would you believe me if I was going to talk about that and leave you see, that's the whole basis. That's what I'm saying to you. It's the sureness of the Savior's sayings. That's your foundation. Here's what he said. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Make up your own mind. Is he a liar or is he here? He's here, isn't he? He says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him or her that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out, he said. I will under no circumstances whatsoever cast out anybody that comes to me for salvation. That's what he's saying. Well, if he doesn't cast you out, what does he do, George? He takes you in. He says, I'm the door. And by me, if anyone enters in, he shall be saved. If you can't get that together, I can't understand why. The Lord Jesus says, I'm here. And if you come to me in repentance before God and put your faith in me as your Savior, I'm telling you you're in. I'll never cast out anybody that comes to me. And if you're in, you're saved. For I am the door, and by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I have to bring this into a level that you can understand. You need a signpost that you can trust, friend. Trust implicitly. Because there's no dummy runs at this thing. If you were to have a brain hemorrhage tonight, or if that heart of yours was to take one final leap in the middle of the night and then lie forever still, you'll never get another chance. That's why God says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Dear, I forgot about the clock there. You nearly were going on to 11 o'clock. I have to be very careful here and be very quick. It's the word of God. It's the living word of God. It's not the dead letter, remember. God is not a book that some man created on a printing press. We treasure 
the written word of God. It's every word of it inspired by God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. These men that wrote it didn't write it out of the top of their head. They were moved by the Spirit of God the way I would take a pen and move it and make it write what I wanted to write. These men were moved. Listen, we treasure God's written word. And our precious Savior is the incarnate word. He is the whole word made flesh. You want to know what this teaches? Look at that. If you haven't had time to learn yet, whether he's an alcoholic or not, look at him. If you want to know what the Bible teaches, just take a look at the Lord Jesus Christ and ask yourself, would he do it? No. Well, then the Bible teaches you shouldn't do it. You'll know that. That's what I had to do in the early days. Peter knew all about being born again. He said in 1 Peter 1 and 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, not of something that corrupts, but of incorruptible by the word of God, listen, which liveth and abideth forever. The Bible is not like any other book on the planet or in existence. The Bible is a living, supernaturally given book given by God. I didn't always believe that. I fought with people who believed in the Bible. I argued with them. I did the devil's work. And you'll find that out if you listen to the testimony. But I'm telling you tonight that this is God's word. Christ said this, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He didn't say the words that I've spoken unto you. He says the words that I speak unto you. When the Holy Spirit takes those words, he makes them live to you again. And Christ is speaking to some of you tonight. The Lord Jesus Christ is calling you home. Did you know it? And I'm telling you that, that these things are not intellectually up or argued about or anything else these are given by God there has to be an element of faith here I remember the Lord Jesus standing looking at that wee woman at the well and he said this to her if I can just find it for a minute and get it over to you he said to this little woman if you knew who it was that's speaking to you he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me the drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. It's not lovely. Here's a wee sinful woman and the Lord's telling her how to get saved. He says, you would have asked me and I would have given Can you give it any simpler than that? And all the blessings that our Lord Jesus Christ has to bestow are included in the spring of living water. Forgiveness of sins. Peace with God. Everlasting salvation from the torments of hell, praise God. Deliverance from the curse. The eternal home in heaven for everyone that trusts in him. A Christ-empowered life. The dynamic of God's spirit flooding your very being. A soul with a wonderful future. A true purpose in life, a mighty Savior who will go with you every second of every day, who will speak to you, who will listen to you when you pray to him. Listen, Donkey Donaldson get saved. After being a wild man, I don't know whether you ever heard of Donkey or not. Some of you have. See you know him. And Donkey every Saturday night it took four policemen to get him home or get him into the cell. He was wild. I remember him with the braces on. He'd say, how you journey? <laughs> and uh, and Donkey gets saved. Donkey Donaldson gets saved. The wildest man in Scotland. And friend, everybody was coming. Do you know he was that full of it the first day when they one of them big, soup, them big shops, them big department stores in, in, in one of the cities, Edinburgh, or Glasgow. And when he saw these coats and all, and the hats and all, and the people standing, you know the models in the window, he was over witnessing to them. The man was away with it all together. He was full of it. And people were telling him, tell him, don't be, I can't believe what is happening. And he would tell them. And after about six months, he was so weary telling everybody. He got a woman to knit him a pullover, and it said, under new management. <laughs> under new management. That says it all. Oh, this wee woman at the well. The Lord was making it clear to her. 
although she was took up with racial and religious and traditional barriers. Do you know, maybe with you it's all Jews or Protestants or Catholics or, 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 or whatever. Can I remind you that there were no such things as Catholics and Protestants on the planet Earth in the days when the Lord Jesus Christ visited this planet and gave us the gospel? Look, God commands all men everywhere to repent. There's only one salvation for the whole bundle of us. And if we miss it, we're lost. And this wee woman standing, arguing with the Lord, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, and she's took up with these racial barriers. Christ cuts through all that. All things were created by him and for him. Do you know this earth of ours? It goes round the sun every 365 and a quarter days. It's spinning on its axis at 19 and a half miles a second. And the moon is orbiting around the earth 250,000 miles away. And we're all going round the sun over there 93 million miles away. And if you were to take a step back, there are 200 billion stars in our own constellation. And they're all turning like a great cartwheel in space at 490,000 miles per hour. And if you take a step back further, there are billions with a B, billions of other constellations far bigger than that one. And do you see when a man or a woman looks up into the starry night and says, I don't believe in God. God doesn't even argue. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. I'm going to finish. <clears throat> you know what the Lord Jesus Christ told Nicodemus? He knew he Nicodemus, he knew his heart. And friend, he knew Nicodemus was wondering, where's the blood and all this? Well, he says, just the way the serpent was lifted up on the pole. Nicodemus, so the Son of Man must also be lifted up. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, Nicodemus, I'm the one. I'm the one that's going to share the love. God has given his son, Nicodemus. Do you know who took the Lord Jesus Christ down from the cross? Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And Christ is telling the one who he knows is one day going to take him down from the cross. I'm the one, Nicodemus, that's going to be on the cross. What am I telling you? I'm telling you God had a plan for his life. And he has a plan for yours. A mighty plan. I'm convinced that's why he changed the message to me. But listen, friend. If Nicodemus hadn't had repented and trusted Christ as his saviour, he would already have been in hell 2,000 years. You see, it's not keeping the commandments that count. We have a built-in inability in that, as far as keeping commandments all the time are concerned. It can't be done. You can't be saved by good behavior. That's why the Savior had to go to Calvary. That's why God sent a sinless, spotless Son so that he could take our place and God could punish him for my stinking sins. So that he could say to me, George, you're free. The Son has made you free. Jesus paid it all. That's the way salvation works, sir. That might seem so simple to those that are saved, but it can be very complicated to a boy like me. I remember struggling with it, but I understand it now. Listen, the Lord's here. There's many other things I wanted to say to you. But you couldn't bear them now. Just let's bear our hearts before the Lord. Because this one who hung on that cross and bore away our sins in his own body on the tree, if we receive him. You see, you can say to yourself, well, if he died for all our sins, then I'm all right, aren't I? No, you're not. If you're invited to a wedding reception and you don't come, the dinner will be there all right, but it will go cold in between the bed. You've got to avail yourself of the provision that has been made, for it won't count for tuppence. Christ isn't rammed himself down anybody's throat.
The Book of the Revelation, as I said last night, reveals that there's going to be a vast crowd in hell. Everybody's not saved. Listen, this whole meeting was convenient for you who you are. The Lord Jesus just simply wants you to do what a child can do. Just come to him and ask him, Lord, I realize I am saved. And I want you to be my Savior. Forgive me. Save me. How do you say that? Doesn't sound very complicated. It can't be complicated. It's for everybody on the planet. And we're not able to understand complicated things. Many of us have never even been to school. Listen. Trust him. Take him at his word. He promised he'll not cost you anything. If you drop dead 30 seconds later, you're in heaven. Or else the Lord's going to have to go to hell with you for he's a liar. Now I'm saying that to show you how rock solid this whole thing is. My Savior can't die. It's impossible to come to that. But you can get your, your wee house on that rock, can't you? You can get it built there so that when the storm does come, Lord, we just commit the meeting to you. Thank you, Lord, for leading us, for guiding us, for helping us to preach a totally different message, whatever, from the one that we were intended to preach three hours ago. And so, Lord, we commit the issues of this meeting to thee. Oh, God, grant that someone will lay hold on eternal life. Grant that someone will see that God who created them and put their teeth in their mouth and their eyes and the sockets of their heads can be trusted. Lord, we're not asking them to join anything. Lord, we're only asking them to get right with their own creator and be saved and be forgiven and go home rejoicing. Lord, we commit everyone to you. And we'll pray that they'll not put this off. Lord, lest they never see the light of another day. Bless this people, Lord. Take them, everyone, not only to their homes in safety, but make the journey easy, Lord. Make it easy. May it not be long, but may it be a blessed time. And grant that tonight there will be angels in heaven rejoicing over even one, one repentant sinner trusting thee. Remember, Lord Jesus Christ, you said, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. We commit ourselves to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.